Uh, it doesn't look like that camera is on. And both of them are on. They're both on. Okay, yes. well, welcome, everybody, to that's the Master's the House. Right now. That's the one that's on right yeah. now. I'm looking at this camera. <laughs> I'm Pastor Jim, and this is my wife, Katie. We are the Langlois. And uh, for you. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, Pastor Jim and Katie You Langlois. don't know who that's you are. <laughs> yeah, I know who I am. And, uh, and so we want to welcome all those who just joined us online. We also have everybody here that's in person. Yay. Let them hear you. <laughs> um, I could turn the cameras the other way, but some of you don't really care for that much. But uh, no. okay, we just welcome no. everybody here today. No. And um, this, uh, this is the Master's House, and we meet in a building called the Virginia Christian Alliance mm -hmm. here near Staples Mill and Parham in the Richmond, Virginia area in a County Henrico. <clears throat> and we meet here at 11 o'clock on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Excuse my throat, it'll clear up. Is it well? And we have praise and worship live. Mm -hmm. So for those that are online and you're in the area, we'd love to have you join us in person. Yeah. And you could come and sing and worship God with us, amen? Yeah. But then we start at 1130 online and preach the word to share around the world. Somebody say amen. Amen. So um, 11 every Sunday and 1130 for online. Okay. Amen. amen. You ready to pray? Yes. <laughs> Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. And I just thank you for this time together here live and here online. And in the future, with the broadcast of this, or anybody who listens to our messages, thank you, Lord. Um, we thank you for your word, Father. I thank you that it is sufficient. Yes. Uh, and that uh, as we stand on it, we will always win and always break through mm -hmm. and always have victory. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, Jesus. I thank you for today. Help us, Katie and I, to share this word with your grace and uh, your ability. I thank you for giving it to me. And, and Katie, and uh, we share it with love in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'm kind of excited about today's message. It kind of came from uh, uh, our Tuesday night meeting. Every Tuesday night, we have what we call a family Zoom meeting. That's awesome. Tell them about it. <laughs> so we meet on Tuesday nights, and mm -hmm. we have family worship. And it's through the Zoom meeting, so it's like only 40 minutes long. Uh, um, the these, the Software called Zoom. Yes, that's yeah. why I said a Zoom meeting. Yeah, a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's fast. It's just no. It's not slow either. No, but it is fun. We literally go through the six steps of the Family Bible Revolution, yes. which is to open our Bible, read the Word, discuss it for how it should change our thinking and living, um, pray for the saints and the lost. I think I skipped one. Do it at the beginning of an end of every day, and then your train go do it. Not yes. it. Yeah, give it five. Yes, awesome. You know, I've only had years um, <laughs> to remember it. But um, what was really cool is I didn't get a chance to really look at the scripture, and I literally did one of these. That looks good. And what did it open to? Uh, it opened to Psalm 144. Yes, I think, I think that's what it was. Very powerful Yeah. Song. And so we got to discuss that, and it was some great discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we had a good group, 12 people there online, and, yeah. and uh, we, we, we read it, and then we discussed it for how it should change our thinking and living. Yeah. Great conversation, and it was it just fired me up um, uh, for this message today. And so I wanted to go a little deeper than, than uh, what we talked about last week, although it was very, very deep. And every Tuesday we do this, so we'll tell you more about it and how you can uh, join us in family worship online on Tuesday nights. Yeah. But let's go to, um, well, let me tell you the title. The title is A Man After God's Own Heart. Everybody say a man. A man. After. After. God's own heart. God's own heart. And I heart. think you're putting that up online, and I she's did. putting it up here so you can see our little uh, title slide there. It's like a little runner. And it looks like he's running and, and uh, uh, running after, sort of, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But uh, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Most of the scriptures today will be from the NLT, being the New Living Translation. Uh, we will look at a couple, couple of the verses, uh, one verse and a couple translations, and the last scripture we'll share will be out of the New King James Version, but most of them will be in the NLT. So this is 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13, verses 13 through 14. And this phrase, everybody say it, a man after, a man after God's own heart. God's own this heart. phrase shows up two times in the Bible, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. It's a prophecy spoken by the prophet Samuel to the king Saul the first king of Israel. And it's God's statement through him concerning the difference between King Saul and King David. Mm. And there was a big difference. Mm -hmm. So let's see what, what uh, 1 Samuel prophesies here, verse 13. You can read that, Katie. All right, this is the New Living Translation. Uh, 1 Samuel 13, 13 through 14. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Have you kept it? The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. 
But now your but kingdom, now I like but that. Now, but, but now, but now your kingdom must end, mm. for the Lord has sought out a man after His own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of His people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. So Saul was headed in the wrong direction, and God said, "I'm not going to do that." And I was going to make your kingdom forever, but I'm changing the pattern here, and I'm going to get David to be the king because he is a man after mm -hmm. God's own heart. Now, I want to say this because um, uh, it, the, the title sounds like it might be just toward uh, the male gender, amen? But I think this is to ladies too. So everything that we're saying today not only applies to a man after God's own heart, but it would apply to a woman after God's own heart. Matter of fact, I really think this right here is a woman after God's own heart. I just thought I'd share that. Says the man after God's own heart. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. <laughs> we're, we're running as fast as we can. Amen. We are. And uh, we're always trying to make up for uh, some lost time, and, and uh, but make sure we stay up with the Lord. Now, um, a second mention of this quote is the Apostle Paul in the New Testament as he preached to the synagogue in, uh, in Antioch. And this is what he said in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. I'll read this one. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Say that. A man after my yeah. own heart. And he will do everything I wanted him to do. I want. Or I want. Uh, he will do everything I want him to do. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Now, you and I know he didn't do everything that God wanted him to do. I'm like, he did do everything God wanted him to do. Let me change that. But he did some other things that God really didn't want him to do. Can somebody yeah. say amen? amen? Do you ever do anything that you know God didn't want you to do? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, I'll be the first one to raise my hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. But this word after, I wanted to look into this word after, a man after my own heart. God was dividing or <clears throat> making a difference between Saul and David. And so he was really saying, David's not after my, I mean, Saul is not after my own heart. Saul, okay. But David is, amen? Yes. And that was the difference he made. So I looked at this, what does he mean, after, a man after? And it's a preposition that comes from a Greek word, kata. Everybody say kata. Kata. How do you spell that? K-A-T-A. -A. Almost your name. Almost. You know, almost. <laughs> Listen to what this means, because it, it, it spoke to me. It means in, in accordance with. So it was a man in accordance with. God's own heart, or a marker of relation. Everybody say relation. Relation. What I find here is, if we, the deeper we get in here, we're going to find out that David had a relationship. Mm. This means a real lot. But listen to this word, after. A man after. It means a marker of relation involving similarity of process. It's a little technical sounding. But here it gets a little deeper. A marker of relation involving correspondence. <gasps> Corresponding. Ooh. So when you are having a relation with somebody, usually you talk, you listen, and you talk, and you share. Right? It's preferred. Yeah, it's preferred. <laughs> right? Listen to this. In, it, it, it's a marker of relation involving correspondence with, I like this, the probable impl implication of some element of reciprocity. Again, real technical. We come from these technical study books, but at any rate, and it means according to, in line with, and after the, man, the manner of. In other words, it's, a, it's a, re a relationship where they're talking to one another. Mm -hmm. They're friends. They know each other, and they're talking back and forth, and listening back and forth. A man after mm -hmm. God's own heart. A man or a woman who has a relationship with God himself. Okay. Isn't that different? Mm -hmm. A relationship with this is very personal, um, just like a friend, just like someone you know really well. And so what we find here is this term, a man after God's own heart, means a man in, relation, in relationship with God or a woman. Now, he knew God as a person. Now, you and I know we've heard of the, the teaching of the Trinity is the, the three and one, the one and three, but they say there's three persons involved. There's the Father God, the Son Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? And one person in three. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes that goes over our head, but you know, whether we understand it or the fullness of it, we just keep going and saying, Yeah, it's one and three and three and one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get it. Sure. Okay, good. Amen. And we learn as we go. And uh, so this is about a person 
in relationship with God. He knew God as a person of the Godhead, being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at the same verse in the message version. version. That would be Acts 13.22, the time when Paul was preaching this in the synagogue in Antioch. And here's the message version of that same verse. You can read that. God removed him from office and put King David in his place. With this commendation, I have searched the land and found this David, son of Jesse. He's a man whose heart beats to my heart, a man who will do what I tell him. A man whose heart beats to my heart. Thump, 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 thump. They're getting to know each other. And a man who will do what I tell him. That's interesting. Well, you and I know he made some big mistakes. But God knows David. And David knows God. This is what this is implying here. Let's look at one more translation. It's the Passion Translation. Acts 13, 22. Read that one. I like this translation. After removing him, God raised up David to be king. For God said of him, I have found in David, son of Jesse, a man who always pursues my heart and will accomplish all that I have destined him to do. Interesting. So even though we know he made mistakes, he was a man that was pursuing God's heart in a relationship and in conversation. He sought to talk to God. He sought to hear from God. He was pursuing the heart of God while he was accomplishing the things that God destined him to be. And so the scripture says that he did that, although he did many things wrong, but he's not mentioning that here. Not right now. So I see this word pursuing as running after. Hence, the, the title slide looked like a man running or a woman running. Uh, running after, seeking after, and chasing after. And I always preach to myself. You know, I always prepare a message because uh, I'm selfish and I want the benefit too. So the more I study the more I, and have to prepare, the more I say, you know, I'll probably learn something going through this process, you know. And so I want to be a person. A man who's running after God. I want to be a person who's seeking after and chasing after God. And I have to ask my question, uh, ask that question to myself. Am I really doing that? You know, or could I improve on it here or there? And I'm sure you know the answers. And uh, I'm sure that everyone in this room and everyone online that's watching, that you too are seeking and pursuing the heart of God. Uh, but he's more than just words on paper. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's a relationship. The more you get to know him, and the more he gets to know you, then this relationship will go far, and you'll be called a man or a woman after God's own heart. Godquestions.org is a website I'd like to look at now, and then Godquestions.org, and this is what it said. The answer to why David was considered a man after God's own heart is found right in this verse. David did whatever God wanted him to do. An obvious question is how could God still call David a man after his own heart when David committed such terrible sins, including adultery and murder? That would make him an adulterous murderer. Just thought I'd say that, you know. But we hadn't heard anything yet about that, but we'll talk about that. So I wrote this down. What was different about Saul and David? And so I really want to talk about how David was many things. Well, name some of the things that he was. So David was a shepherd, yeah. first. Mm -hmm. uh, a musician. Yeah, that's good. Um, these are things he did. A writer. He wrote. He was a writer, and he wrote seventy-three of the hundred and fifty psalms. Almost half of them he wrote himself. So that, to me, was part of his communication between him and God was the things that he wrote. And we're going to look at some of those today to find out what he was seeking, what was he pursuing when he wrote some of these things. As a matter of fact, we're going to read three psalms in its entirety, and we'll just look at some portions of others, to look at this man, David, and see what it meant to him, or how does it show us that he is a man after God's own heart. What else was he? Um, he was a king. A king, wow. And? A murderous adulterer, having killed Uriah the Hittite and committed adultery with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Well, hallelujah. Everybody say, thank God. Thank God. David had a relationship with God. David had a relationship with God. <laughs> he was a man, and now, now we're going to look at his life, and, and I came up with some words to try to explain who he was and why God called him a man after his own heart. Psalm 25, 16 through 21. Uh, there's, three, there's four words I want to look at here. You can say it after me. Repentance. 
Repentance. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Integrity. Integrity. And here's a good one. You ready for this one? Mm -hmm. You can say it. Honesty. Honesty. Oh my gosh. Psalm 25. This is him writing. Now, here's the amazing thing. This king lived a long time ago. Long time ago. And we have the actual things that he wrote. He wrote this himself and it's going to show us who he is. That's amazing. We have the exact thing he wrote. Psalm 25, 16 through 21, New Living Translation. He says, Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone in, and in deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. Oh, save me from them all, he says. Feel my pain and see my trouble. Now, he's talking to the Lord. Forgive all my sins. See how many enemies I have and how viciously they hate me. Protect me, rescue my life from them. Do not let me be disgraced, for in you, listen to this, after all he said about himself, he says, in you I take refuge. Boy, that takes some boldness to say that after the mistakes he's made. May my, or he says, may integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you. Wow. That's a powerful statement. Another word that we see in the life, well, I mentioned it, we did say that. Repentance, forgiveness was the second word. And David also penned Psalm 51. And this is what it says about it in one of my books. And we're going to read the entire psalm, but go ahead and read this quote here in one of my commentaries. Okay. David penned Psalm 51, a contrite sinner's prayer for pardon after his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. In this psalm, David brokenheartedly confesses his sin and asks for God's forgiveness and restoration. Let's hear his heart here. Psalm 51, 1 through 17, New Living Translation. Have mercy on me, God, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stains of my sins. How could he say that without knowing and believing that that's what he was going to do? For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. You skipped verse I, two. I, I, I skipped verse two. Excuse yeah. me. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> Would you read verse two yeah. since I left it out? Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what's evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Oops, I just closed out my, yeah, there we go. Verse 6, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. That's interesting that he says that. He says, wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. He's got some faith in something here. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me or restore to me the joy of your salvation. He's got some knowing who God is to be saying these things. And make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach ways, your ways to rebels and they'll return to you. This is why he wrote. He writes the things down. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. Mm. Wow, what a prophetic word. You'll not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Mm. Now you could say, well, you know, God, God inspired him to write that, so it's really the words of God. Yes, but it wouldn't have been able to be written unless the person writing it had some character who knew him. Mm. That's right. 
He had to know David knew who he was so he could write the words that God wanted him to write. Yes, it's God's word. Yes, it's inspired by God and David is writing down what God's saying. But he couldn't do it through a vessel that wasn't yielded to him or pursuing him. Right. It would never have happened. Right. We would not have these 73 Psalms written by this man if he didn't have um, an, an amount of character that God could say that through. Mm -hmm. And if he didn't know who God was concerning sin and righteousness right. and right. that there was a Messiah coming, he knew all of this and he trusted in it. So God could use his hand to write this. That's good. Humility is the next word I want to cover. He was a man of great humility. You know, uh, I'll let you read this in a minute, but I find that people who are brought up in lowly circumstances are usually more humble than those who everything has worked out for them. And they have a chance to understand if you do get raised up a level, you say, you know, well, gee, I, I, I don't really deserve this, you know. I'm just from a humble home. How could, how could I do that, you know? That, that creates a humble person. But somebody who's born in royalty and all of that, and they're the greatest, it's a little difficult to say, well, I can't do this without God, you know. So I think it's, it's, it's a good thing if we've been born a little lonely. Somebody say amen. We got a ways to grow. The video is gone. The video is gone. Yeah, it's going to keep recording. It it had a broadcast okay. interruption. A broadcast interruption. Sure you know. Hallelujah. Thank you. So hopefully it gets back on. Right. on it's going to. Hopefully we can just upload it later. So look what he says here about him, him and his upbringing, in First Samuel eighteen twenty two through twenty three, and I want you to see the humility that he has in this. Go ahead. Okay. Then Saul told his men to say to David. The king really likes you, and so do we. Why don't you accept the king's offer and become his son-in-law? When Saul's men said these things to David, he replied, How can a poor man from a humble family afford the bride price for the daughter of a king? Wow. He's very humble and say, Well, you know, how can you do this, King Saul? Because I don't really have, you know, a royalty in my family or anything like that. I'm just from a humble home. Somebody say amen. There's a book that I uh, have, a commentary, and um, it's called Luke the Historian, and it's on the book of Acts, and this was a note that it had. Read that. That David can be called a man after God's heart when he was such a notorious sinner is a great encouragement to all believers. Can somebody say amen? Amen. And I wrote this, as a man after God's own heart, David is a role model for all of us. And I want to learn that, too, because I want to be after his own heart mm -hmm. and changeable and moldable, amen, as I go through life. And I found out another thing here that he's also much like John the Baptist in this concept of uh, unless God does it, you're not going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So read John chapter 3, verses 25 through 30, and this is about John the Baptist. Go ahead. This is the New Living Translation. Mm -hmm. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over a ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. And everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. So the concept is, is you know, you, you know, you know this, this guy is outdoing you. And, and what are you going to do about this? I mean, don't you, you feel like you're in competition? But he said something in verse 27. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you. I'm not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. And the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must, must become less and less. Somebody say amen. Amen. He was very humble, John the Baptist, but I also see David in that when saying, look, I, I just, I'm just a, a little shepherd boy, you know, and, and I'm going to be king. Well, I, I don't know how that could happen, but it, it can only happen through the Lord because mm -hmm. he can't do it himself. Amen. Mm -hmm. amen. So all the promises of God, we can't do ourselves. We just receive by faith, amen, yes, especially amen. Our, our, our salvation and forgiveness and righteousness. Amen. Now, he was also a man of great faith and trust. I'll read this one in 1 Samuel 17, talking about David's faith and trust, verses 41 through 47. 
Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt uh, at his ruddy-faced boy. At this ruddy-faced boy, excuse me. I'm a dog, he roared at David. No, I'm, I've got to get better at reading today. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you came at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied this to the Philistine. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will cut you and cut off your head. <laughs> I will kill you. What did yeah. I say? He said cut you. I will cut you. <laughs> I will, I, I, my reading skills are so great today. And I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will get the, the reading... Any, any goodness in my reading comes from the goodness, Lord. Goodness. Goodness, yes. Yeah, that's good. My English <laughs> skills. I'm having fun. Uh, I, uh, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. But not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. And he will give you to us. Mm -hmm. David had a relationship with God. Amen. And he knew who God was. And he wasn't going to take any of the credit himself knowing that he can't do anything in his own strength. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and, and that also brings us to that he was a man of worship. Read that, Katie. Even though his poor choice with Bathsheba led to much heartache for many years to come... David never stopped worshiping God. Never. It is believed that Psalm 32 was also written by David at about the same time as Psalm 51. Now we read Psalm 51. Let's read Psalm 32. And verses 1 through 11. It's a short one. You can go ahead. Okay. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. He had some trust. Whose sin is put out of sight. Wow. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord as clear has cleared... What? Hold on. Yes. What joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt. Thank you. Whose lives are lived in complete honesty. If I say complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. There's an interlude There's an there. Interlude right there. <laughs> Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I'm going to read that again. I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. Mm. Go ahead. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Another interlude. Interlude. He had faith that he was forgiven. I love that one. Mm -hmm. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. And it's his desire that others would learn the things that he knows. This is why he became a writer. Keep going. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. Interlude. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. Wow. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. I really like, let me go back yeah. here. Um, I just really like verse 5. Go ahead. I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. To me, that is true humility. Yeah. Because when you are willing to break down the wall of pride and step through and say, I have, I have some things, Lord, that I need you to take care of. I need you to reveal to me. I need you to break me down so that I can have that contrite and flexible and, and heart of warmth, um, you know, that I can walk in your ways. It's only in that moment that moment that we choose to break down that wall of pride, um, that we are actually able to walk in what he has for us. But if we don't, we're just walking with a veil over our eyes. Right. And what I see as I was reading all of this last night is we're watching this relationship that David has with him in his writing. He just is writing how he talks to God 
He's writing what it means to him. And he's writing what he's heard from God. And then he's writing so we can hear what he, or the Lord wants us to know through what he's writing. That's mm -hmm. one way to say it. Another thing I want to say, and I've said it before, is that David knew the Lord. He knew him. He wouldn't have been able to write these things if he didn't know who he was. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, we had a, a, a message called God is Good. Amen. And if you remember, we really discussed this particular scripture that he wrote himself in Psalm 34, 8. Read that one. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. He wrote that. He couldn't have written any of this if he did not believe that God is good. And the foundation of any faith of anybody is to know that it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And he knew God was good in the midst of all of this. So this is why he could say, ah, I'm a mess here, but you are good and you can take care of me and, and help me accomplish what I want to do, which is be obedient to you. Now you're smiling. You have something to say? I was just thinking about Kennard over here. Yes, Kennard. And how he made that wonderful statement yes. where nobody else can taste for you. Yeah. They can they can tell you what they think. They can tell you that they think it's good or their preference or they think it's bad. But ultimately, it's you that has to do the tasting, and that was all canard. And the it's only way smile. to really <laughs> taste it is to eat it and chew it, which means the Word of God. Yes, right. You know, get into it and get the Word of God and find out how good he is. Once you understand that, no matter what you're facing, you know, well, wait a minute, but my God, God. is good. Amen. So I've got to find out the dynamics of that. He's always good. Yeah. Amen? And so he wrote, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. That is David's heart writing in Psalm 34. Eight. I love to hear this. That's the actual words he wrote, inspired by God. He was also obedient. Well, it, in the scripture it says that he did all that the Lord wanted him to do. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yes. Just amazing. And uh, so he was obedient. Let's look at Psalm 40, verse 8. You can read it. Okay. I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. Now, I take joy in, in fulfilling God's will. And I don't take joy in when I mess up. But looking at this model, <laughs> there's hope for me. If I keep myself humble and confess in honesty and, and transparency and, and in integrity with God, that um, I'm okay. You know, Amen. this was before Christ had even come. And he knows what God's going to do for him. He knew that he wouldn't just be, his sins wouldn't be covered. He said his sins would be washed mm -hmm. and cleansed. Words. Boy, what great faith. And he knew the word. He knew the Old Testament word of the prophetic word of his Savior, Messiah, Jesus Christ. So he was obedient. I take joy in doing your will, my God, mm -hmm. for your instructions are written on my heart. And I wrote this, to those who know that God is good, the Ten Commandments, like we have in the wall there, are words of life and not words of death. They're guidance to, for us to succeed in life. Amen? Amen? And we can't throw those away. It's God's moral law. But it's not just law to bind us, it's law to free us to know the difference between right and wrong. Amen. I like this one too. You can say this point. He loved God. How do we know he did? Well, read Psalm 18, 1. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. Mm. Say this, I love you, God. I love you, God. Now, when you do it on your own, do it in a personal relationship, person to person. The first person of the Godhead, you're a person. In relationship, conversing. This is what David did. This is how he did it. Another one is he gave all the glory to God. We discussed this a little bit on Tuesday during our Zoom meeting, but 2 Samuel 8, we're not going to read it, but you can just write this down. You can read chapter 8 of uh, 2 Samuel. It's a record of David's military victories. We all know he had a lot of victories. And I found out that according to old, the Old Testament, King David fought in eight to nine major battles, and he did not lose any of them. Mm. Not one. Isn't that awesome? There's a website called thebiblejourney.org, and I found this note. Go ahead and read this. King David is often looked upon as the most successful military conqueror in the history of the Israelite nation. 
By the end of his reign in 971 BC, the boundaries of Israel and the neighboring vassal kingdoms who paid tribute to David stretched across the Fertile Crescent from the Wadi of Egypt to the river Euphrates. And this brought me back to Psalm 144. Hmm. Oh. Yes. We're going to read this whole thing again, but this is the psalm we were discussing last Tuesday. And I thought to myself, you know, this man has won every battle that he faced to gain all that ground for the kingdom of God. And this is what he had to say about it. <laughs> psalm 144. I'll start it. Maybe you can finish it. Okay. We'll read the whole thing, 1 through 15. Praise the Lord, who is my rock. He trains my hands for war, and gives my fingers skill for battle. He is my loving ally and my fortress, my tower of safety, my rescuer. He is my shield, and I take refuge in him. He makes the nations submit to me. O oh Lord, what are human beings that you should notice them, mere mortals that you should think about them? For they're like a breath of air. Their days are like a passing shadow. Open the heavens, Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so they billow smoke. Hurl your lightning bolts and scatter your enemies. Shoot your arrows and confuse them. Reach down from heaven and rescue me. Rescue me from deep waters, from the power of my enemies. Their mouths are full of lies. They swear to tell the truth, but they lie instead. You see, every one of those battles, he never got filled with pride in thinking about how good a leader he is. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, not one of these battles would have been won if it weren't for God himself. Mm -hmm. I take no credit. I take no glory for it. I couldn't have done this without him. Okay. And then he begins here in um, verse, nine. verse 9. I'll sing a new song to you. Now remember, he's a musician and he writes songs. I'll sing a new song to you, O God. I will sing your praises with a ten-stringed harp. For you grant victory to kings. He's saying this to all of his army, all of his soldiers, all of the people in Israel. He's saying this to them and to God. Hallelujah. Where did I stop? Uh, you rescued. Yeah. You rescued your servant David from the fatal sword. Verse 11. Save me. Rescue me from the power of my enemies. Their mouths are full of lies. They swear to tell the truth, but they lie instead. May our sons flourish in their youth like, youth -like well-nurtured plants. Let me say that better than that. May our sons flourish in their youth, there you go, like well-nurtured plants. May our daughters be like graceful pillars carved to beautify a palace. May our barns be filled with crops of every kind. May the flocks in our fields multiply by the thousands, even tens of thousands. He's asking God for great things here. And may our oxen be loaded down with produce. May there be no enemy breaking through our walls, no going into captivity, no cries of alarm in our own town squares. Yes, joyful are those who live like this. Joyful indeed are those whose God is the Lord. He's giving every bit of everything he's ever done in his life, be it a shepherd, or the killer of Goliath, or all of these wars that he faced, and all the enemies that he faced. No, he's giving all the glory to God. Mm -hmm. I never could have done it myself. Remember, Lord, why did you choose me? I'm just from nobody. I don't even have a royal family or anything. Very humble. Back to the book on the Luke, Luke the historian, the book of Acts. We said this earlier, and I'm going to say it again. That David, oh, that David can be called a man after God's heart when he was such a notorious sinner, is a great encouragement to all believers. And I wrote this. David believed God's word in his heart and confessed it with his mouth through writing and singing. His faith pleased God just like Abraham, and he was counted as righteous in his sight. And this will be our ending scripture in Romans chapter 4, verses 19 through 22. This is talking about Abraham. But think about David's perspective also. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore 
it was accounted to him for righteousness. So all the Old Testament believers that trusted in the Messiah to wash them clean from their sin and enable them to live their lives, when they gave glory to him, he was saying that they were accounted as righteousness because they believed it in their heart and confessed it with their mouth. And that's what David did through his writing and through his praise. And that's who he was. And he was a man after God's own heart. So we can all be people after man's, uh, God's own heart. Amen? Amen? David is a role model for us. And this message is for men and women. Let's pray. Do you have anything to say before we close? I'm chewing on it. So no. Not, not yet. <laughs> Want me to wait a minute? No. Mm, I'd like to hear what you have to say. I don't know. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pray, but you can continue after we're done. We'll see. Father, we just thank you. Help us to understand what it means to be a person after God's own heart. All those words, repentance, forgiveness, honesty, integrity, faith, knowing that you're good. Father, I just thank you that no matter what our past is, that when we're in you, in Christ, born again, by believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth and call upon you that you become our Savior. You wash us clean. We are not accounted righteous in your sight. Now we become righteous in your sight because your blood has finally paid the price. There's no accounting done. It's the work has been paid. And Father, I thank you for everybody in this room and everybody watching online or anybody that's watching this video in the future. I pray it's a tug like it is to me to be a man after God's own heart, or a woman after God's own heart. And what does that mean? What it means is we're gonna to have to grab onto his word and believe it no matter what, that it's sufficient and that it's all consuming. And what he says is who we are in Christ, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Wow, wow. Amen. So do you have something? No? No, oh, told you. Hallelujah, well I pray that blesses you. And uh, so, and everybody who's online, and it makes a difference in their lives. It just gets me thinking, am I a man after God's own heart? And so it's a good time to review, amen, ourselves. And no matter what we've done in the past, we've got to also say, well, you know, wait a minute. It's either been cleansed or it hasn't. And so he says it is. So I trust in his word, and so it is. We're the righteousness of God in Christ, because he said so. In Jesus, name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And sometimes we don't feel that way, but, but we just got to get our emotions under control of what the Word says. Well, somebody say amen. amen. It's time to give unto the Lord. I love to give unto the Lord. How about you? I do. And uh, again, we have a lot of supporters online and also through here. And uh, I want to thank you for your support of this ministry. We are a teaching ministry. And uh, we are... Uh, teaching in several countries. We've got a lot of people who watch online and uh, we're making a difference. So I want to thank you for supporting in tithes and offerings and also in missions. And every month we support a different missions ministry. And so this month we're going to, this will be November for the next uh, four Sundays. I think there's four Sundays this month. We're going to raise a missions offering for uh, Brother Terry Horn of Metro City Kids. He's a longtime friend of mine who was a, a children's minister in outreach in the inner cities of Richmond, and now he's down in Jacksonville. He's been preaching the gospel to children for over 48 years. Amen? And he goes into there, and he's got a truck with all of his video equipment and his sound system and his train set up, and he goes and ministers to the kids every week mm -hmm. for 48 years, getting kids saved and giving them uh, uh, materials on Jesus as being Lord uh, for the kids who have never heard the gospel. And so... Uh, we're going to support him this month and uh, for Terry Horn and believe God for his ministry. And I have a, a yeah, picture of him there. You can kind of see the video truck behind him. And, and he blesses kids every week, and we're going to be a part of that. So um, if you'd like to give, uh, Kate's going to tell you how to support this ministry. <laughs> All right. So uh, the first way is you can always do snail mail if you are online. Snail mail. Yes. And I have that listed up on the uh, broadcast here once it's actually on the broadcast um, you can also go to tmhnow.org uh, which is our actual church website and yep. you can go to the giving page we use the um, app called tidely um, t-i-t-h-e dot l-y and what i like about tidely 
is that a lot of times it will not let me do that. There we go. Um, is that you can also download it to your device. Yeah. Uh, so you can put it on your phone or you can put it on your iPad and you can give through there. But just make sure that if you're giving to the master's house, it's the master's house in Mechanicsville, Virginia, because that's our PO box address. Um, but also you can indicate uh, your type of gift, whether it's a tithe or an offering or mission, so yeah. that we make sure that 100% goes into the right area. Yeah, whatever's uh, meant for, or, or sown towards missions, 100% mm -hmm. of that go for this month, for the next four weeks will go directly towards Terry Horn and his yeah. ministry. Yeah. Yeah. And if you are here, present, um, there is a black locked box there at the back near Machi. With an um, envelope. With an envelope, you can indicate again where you would like your gift to go. Yes. And so, we again, we thank you for your support. So let's pray over our giving. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. And we thank you that our giving will bear fruit and come back uh, producing fruit, changing lives, people being saved, people being healed and delivered and families being restored in Jesus name everybody said amen amen and just about closing before we close if they want to know those that are online or, or here would like to know more about us how would they find that out okay so you can always go to our website tmhnow.org mm -hmm. um, you can also check out some of our uh, recent archived messages I guess you would call them yeah um, you can check it out at the website on the messages tab or you can check out our YouTube which is tmhrva yeah um, you can also check us out or connect with us on Facebook at TMH Now. Which they're on right now. Uh, well, they will be. And um, then also our vision site for family, which is familybiblerevolution.com, uh, where you can check out Get on the Right Track, a video, and then the other six FBR snapshots that give you um, just a, they're little quick videos that give you a snapshot of what is the Family Bible Revolution all about and how can it change your family and your legacy forever. Yeah, um, we I've also started a revolution, yes. and in order to learn about it really quickly, just go to the familybiblerevolution.com and watch those little short videos, and they'll help you learn real quick about what we're doing. And uh, it's a different message than I grew up on. Yeah. Somebody say amen. Amen. Go ahead. And then you can actually practice with us. So yeah. if you're like, mm, I don't know about this thing. I don't know how if it's going to be difficult. It's actually quite easy. We've discovered that even a child can do it, as in a child has gotten up here, several children actually, yeah. and have led family worship before. Yeah. Super easy. Um, so if a child can do it, the head of the home can do it. Absolutely. Um, so we have Zoom family worship every Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, if you go to tmhnow.org, um, you can actually click on the uh, calendar on that Tuesday and all your credentials are there to just log right on in. We don't go over 40 minutes because it cuts us off at 40 minutes. So therefore, we value your time. We have to get it done. Anyway. Yes, we do. But it's a wonderful time of fellowship and discussion and just really diving deeper and seeing other people's perspectives yeah. and what stood out to them. Um, it's just a wonderful time to just discuss God's Word. And it's not just us talking to you, it's us talking together. It's a lot of fun. Right. And uh, as you can see, last Tuesday inspired this message. So you never know what's going to happen. You never Tuesday. know. Yeah. 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 And then if you have any prayer requests or you want to connect, you can email Pastor Jim here at Pastor Jim at tmhnow.org. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, yeah. we want to say goodbye to our friends online. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you again uh, next Sunday at 11.30. But again, I want to invite you to come at 11 o'clock because we have worship here. And you can be a part of that if possible. And uh, so I'm going to pray for those that are leaving. After we uh, leave you from the online uh, folks, we're going to sit here just a few minutes and discuss together what this message meant to us. What did we like? What, what did we learn? Or what made a difference to us? And kind of have an open discussion. And maybe you can do that where you are, too. So, Father, I thank you for all those that are online. I call you blessed, happy, whole, and healthy in Jesus' name. We thank you for coming, and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye. Everybody say goodbye. <laughs> Hallelujah.